podcast episode number 21. I'm very excited about our guest we have on with us today. Uh, before I get into that, I do have some housekeeping items to mention. Uh, number one, uh, just a shout out to the sponsor of the Strength Athlete Podcast. That's going to be SBD USA. They are purveyors of extremely top quality powerlifting equipment, knee sleeves, etc. If you want to check them out, you can get free shipping on an order of any size at sbd-usa.com. Unfortunately, that is U.S. listeners only. I apologize. I know we have a lot of international listeners, but uh, move to America and you too can save 6 or $7 on shipping. Um, <laughs> Second to that, uh, if you are a frequent listener or even if you are not a frequent listener, please do make a point of leaving a review in the iTunes store on the Strength Athlete Podcast. Five-star reviews help us to be more attractive to sponsors as well as to encourage us and our beautiful friends to make more episodes of our show. So please do make a point. Just log right into the podcast app. You don't even have to log in. You can just open it up on your phone. You can do it on your computer. Click that five stars and everyone goes home happy. Lastly, if you are in the UK or Ireland, specifically in Basingstoke near London, or if you are in the north near Leeds, or if you live near Cambridge in the UK, or in Ireland, if you are from Limerick, or if you are from Dublin, we are giving a series of seminars from March 31st through April the 7th. Uh, you can find details about all of those seminars at thestrengthathlete.com slash TSA hyphen seminars with an S plural. Eric figured that out. Um, <laughs> anyway, on to, on to the important stuff. Uh, our podcast today is actually with uh, an author who wrote a book that we, uh, you know, I, I got recommended to me kind of indirectly. Uh, looking back on episode number three with Dr. Quinn Hennock, he's a, a prolific physical therapist who we are all a big fan of and all appreciate his work and the quality of what he does. And thus, I, I tend to appreciate the opinions that he has on what is worthwhile reading material. Uh, he posted a uh, kind of a social media post a while back that was specifically showing the cover of a book called Sleep, the Myth of Eight Hours, the Power of Naps, and the New Plan to Recharge Your Body and Mind, uh, which is authored by Nick Littlehales, who is joining us today to talk about sleep and optimization of performance. Nick, if you want to say hello. Hi, guys. Great to have uh, be on your podcast and uh, look forward to the show. We are joined as well by Eric Bodhorn and Joe Stanek. What's up? Luke. Hi. Hi, Ray. Hi, Luke. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so basically, you know, I, I wanted to, I've wanted to do a podcast on sleep for a long time because, you know, Bryce, Bryce said something really astute in a previous episode that, you know, everyone is always thinking about how can we train harder to, to get a better output from, you know, how, what can we do that's more to get a better output from training when, you know, people don't really think about it in the context that you could probably do a better job recovering and increase your gains by an equally measurable amount. And so something as simple as taking a, a few of the steps that are outlined in this book and, and that hopefully we'll, we'll get Nick to talk a little bit more about can go a long way towards improving your ability to move forward in your training and progression. And this doesn't only apply to powerlifting as, uh, you know, Nick, you were describing to us earlier that you've, you've actually never specifically worked with lifters, but that you, or let's say lifters who their sport is lifting, but that it, there's some, you know, some parallels that could probably apply there, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, we have a, a pretty tough sport called uh, rugby league over in, over here in the UK, present prominently based in the uh, northwest of our country. There's the uh, there's the other even harder version out in Australia, <clears throat> which have even more demands on, on the physical self. But very much part of their overall training program is is their is powerlifting weights and um, keeping their physical form in in the optimum shape. And they uh, they do use that. Uh, um, probably more than they would use any other sort of type of exercise or uh, training techniques. Excellent. And, you know, you, uh, before we started this podcast, he, you, you made a, a funny parallel between powerlifters and rugby union players. He said, you know, they lift weights all the time and they take lots of supplements. And so that was, <laughs> in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. There is a sort of, um, there is a funny side to that, I suppose. But I, th I think as I became involved with the sport, <clears throat> uh, it's a couple of years ago now when I was, I was asked by the uh, the Rugby Football League's Player Welfare Program 
to actually go around and educate all 16 Super League clubs. So this wasn't club versus club. This was actually all the players and athletes within the sport uh, and to go into every single club and to to help them with their, their approach to recovery, uh, sleep, mental and physical recovery. And, you know, I became aware of the sport a lot more and it was, you know, it did put a smile on your face when you walked into a, a large sort of metal shed up in the north of England on a cold, wet, rainy day. And, and it's absolutely full of uh, weight machines and, and also long tables of full of supplements of all different types um, that uh, the individuals were using, uh, whether it's, you know, excuse my ignorance if I say anything that's not quite correct, but, uh, you know, protein, supplements, things like that, anything to, to keep them high uh, and motivated and alert, uh, those kind of stimulants. And, uh, you know, a number of the coaches around some of the teams who've come from Australia or New Zealand, because that's predominantly where rugby league would be played as well as the UK, um, they just literally stand there and go addicted, 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 pointing at all the players. Uh, with using the term addicted. And I think they use it addicted to, you know, I just can't lift enough. I just need to keep lifting. I need to keep pushing it. I, if, I'm, if I'm sat doing nothing, then something's going wrong. So I think they mean addicted in that respect. But they also meant if they didn't consume, I exaggerate, because I don't really know, but... If they didn't consume this large tub of equivalent protein supplements mixed with something else every hour, every minute of their day, then they were also failing. And if it wasn't there, they couldn't lift or they couldn't be a person if they didn't take this stuff. So I think it, it's not sort of, would you relate it to be addicted to a hard drug? I don't know. But there is a lot of evidence that... Uh, we, we can, we might well be getting close to that in certain areas of sport or life. It's, it's funny that you say that, uh, Nick, because it's that, that whole supplement mentality. The, the reason that that's humorous is because that's very prevalent among novice lifters of all kinds. Uh, you know, the, that's, <laughs> that's the, the oh, I would just hit the supplement and I'd be fine. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. You know, you, you, people are getting to the point now where there's videos all over the internet of people, you know, using a razor blade and lining up pre-workout supplements and snorting caffeine and, Thank uh, you. Which is, you know, absolutely mental, right? But uh, I've I've seen someone do it in person, and it's hilarious. Uh, Eric, that's actually your client. But um, we, we... <laughs> guys, you know, guys, I, know who, I think I know who you're talking about. One of those things of being involved in a in a uh, what we, most people would class as a strange, unknown world of sleep. Um, and nearly twenty years ago, when I sort of started to 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 knock on the door of, of the world of sport and think, you know, what do you do? In those 20 years, you have gone from zero data collection, no sports science, uh, probably if you go back a little bit earlier, social media, information at the end of your fingertips, you can wrap all of those things together. And certainly in the last five, five or six years, in my career working in around the sport, I spend more time coaching, not necessarily for a direct performance factor, that's a default of getting it right, but it's actually to deal with these issues. And what you just described, Hanu, would not have been, would have been almost unthinkable not that long ago, but it's moved so quickly into, as you say, you know, like, snorting supplements as if it's like cocaine off a table it's like weird and I, and I, I think that's why the subject matter sleep i think that's why it's it's more of a a more uh, it's not serious subject it's a more relevant subject to a lot more people in the population because of these factors not necessarily for all the right reasons 
Right. That's fair. They're, they're kind of taking two steps backward. They're not sleeping well and they're addicting themselves to caffeine. So they're kind of two notches behind where they should be. Yeah. And we can get them two notches forward here. And before we get too far off topic, uh, while I do agree that caffeine is, is almost like a, it's almost like a drug these days, how, how much people take and how much it's sold and mixed up in different, you know, different, uh, types of things, be it uh, energy drinks in the, in the cans or the pre-workout supplements, but we'll, we'll try to try to stay from deviating too far from the subject at hand. Um, getting back into kind of the content of the book, you do, you do open it up by talking about chronotype. And so as I understand it, chronotype relates to, or at least how you define it in context of sleeping relates to whether you function better typically in the AM or the PM and how you can define your your sleep characteristics or your your habits let's say to to suit that more effectively could you could you give a kind of a brief overview of that i think it's one of these things um like you pointed out with the title on the book about the myths of eight hours i'd always uh, in all my industry experience i'd always come across this you know get a good eight hours sleep and see in the morning we'll get on with our day type of concept but you know, I was always investing, investigating things and thinking, well, you know, I've not met many people who actually are able to sleep for eight hours, 365 days of the year. So maybe maybe there is something else. And I think that's part of it. So I looked into, you know, just just using technology to look back uh, and see if there was uh, other ways that the human being had done it. And I found out that it wasn't that long ago that we didn't even try to sleep in eight hours at night. So there was a little moment when I thought, hang on a minute, what else is untrue? And uh, chronotyping was one of those. I'm old enough, you know, in my 57th year to remember, you know, people around me talking about owls and larks. And I knew that they referred to birds, an owl at night and a lark in the morning. But it was almost like, you know, you're an owl because you you enjoy the night time or you're a lark because you enjoy the morning time. So I thought, so as we've been, gone along and, and technology allows us to get better in fact, suddenly you realize it's a genetic twist. This is not something you make up. Uh, it's a little genetic twist with your internal biological clock with the external circadian rhythms of the day. And it simply means is that in simple terms, the morning chronotype basically starts to generate serotonin, the hormone that tells the brain to be active and unsuppress, rather than the melatonin, which does the opposite. It, we cre I'm an am -er, I'm a morning type. So we, we tend to create this much quicker as the sun hits our horizon. Um, the, the nighttime chronotype, the pm -er, um, basically does that about an hour or possibly two hours later, dependent on a lot of factors. So we do know that there are people, and maybe within the group of people listening to this, uh, what you know, you Hanno, what's your chronotype? You Luke, you Eric, is that at the end of the day, when you look at it, it does mean that I love getting up in the morning. I always switch my alarm clock off. You can't talk to me about waking up at eight o'clock and nine o'clock. That just doesn't exist in my world. As soon as I switch the alarm clock off, I'm off, I'm starving, I want to eat, I want to hydrate, I want to fuel up, I want to empty my bowel, and, and I want to do stuff. I can I can deal with all my mental functions so much more easily up until lunchtime. The physical challenges so much easier and get better data and, and achieve better. But that's not the same for the PM chronotype. And to keep this brief, when you start to look at that and realize it's genetic, and then you start to think about yourself personally and every day of, of what you're being asked or asking yourself to do at certain times, you suddenly realize that maybe just a subtle shift in your daily routine could put certain things in the right places and certain things in other places to minimize their effect on you or to maximize what you're trying to achieve. And to conclude on that, what you do know it's not scientific research, but maybe maybe uh, not to hijack your podcast, guys, but maybe if you just asked every listener to identify their chronotype, I would pretty much put, you know, the price of a signed book, uh, which is not that much, but the price of a signed book on the fact that in all the generic research I do, I think that the population is generally split, split 
70-30 on chronotypes. Whenever I ask a group of people, whether it's 20 or 2,000, to wear a simple description of what do you think your chronotype is, I get a 70-30 split or 60-40 split because it's not scientific. I'm not doing research. But I tell you, I've been doing it now for a few years and it happens all the time. Now, that means in every day, 70% of the population are living in a morning chronotypes world, which is not actually suited to them. And when you put that inside a team or an organization or small group, whether you're coaching them or you as an individual part of a group, if you can just identify this little, it could absolutely be a game changer. A game changer. Uh, for all sorts of reasons, which you wanted a short uh, synopsis of that, and I'll keep it to that. What are some things that you can do to kind of identify which one you might be? Um, you can you can do a little test, but the test, honestly, guys, I could do that on you, Hanu, now. Right? Is, uh, you know, what's the best time of your day? Uh, well, actually, you know, it's funny you say that because I tend to thrive with mental tasks in the morning and physical tasks in the early afternoon. Right. What uh, time is your most consistent wake time? Not the one that you have to wake to do your life, do your job. I feel terrible saying I feel terrible saying this now that you oh. and this, that's why the other guys are laughing. It's it's about nine a.m. lately. Nine a.m. Okay. And uh, what time do you what time do you normally not time specifically? I'm just saying. You like going to bed at 10, 11, 12, 1, 2. When do you feel the most comfortable? I typically try to get to sleep between 12 and 1. Aha. Uh -huh. So if I took you onto your little, you know, island that's ruled by Hanu, Hanai, Hanai, Hanu. <coughs> Hanny. <laughs> Hanny. Uh, I was with a, a Hanu <laughs> in Germany last week, so excuse me if I get Hanu and Hanny. But... Um, if you're on your little island <clears throat> and you had total control of everything else, then you probably would be getting up at 9 a.m. or later. Uh, no, I think probably not. I think I'd probably be up with the sun or shortly thereafter. Really? I do think so, because I'd be sleeping earlier because I wouldn't have electronics to keep me up. And that's, I mean, that's what it is. I, I find myself working at night and uh, I'm taking some classes online. And so I... Uh, I tend to do things into the evening as opposed to in the morning, which is funny because I do better in the morning. So it's it's this funny anti-logical. So it is anti-logical. And that's because if you'd only gone through from the point of birth through, you know, parents looking after you, schooling, education, maybe maybe you, you were given my book on your first birthday to read. Um, along that route, everything that you would have been introducing into your life of when do you do this, why do you do that, and all sorts of things would have had that in the back of your mind. And, and I think that's a really good point, that in, even in a few seconds, with some very simple, simple questions that anybody can ask themselves or each other, the reality is, is that you have a lifestyle that makes you work 24-7. You have to do things in the evening, uh, like we all have to, and we have to do things in the morning because we're all in an AM as world. But if we took those away without any thought whatsoever, you went, no, Nick, you're wrong. I would not go. I'd not wake up after nine o'clock. I'd be up with the sun. Right now, a PM -er can't say that to you. So you are from that very simple thing. I think we could safely say you're an AM -er chronotype with a little bit more investigation that would point that way because a PM. -er, whether the other guys uh, can relate to this, a PM just simply can't do that. It's just not in their makeup at all to say, I'd wake up with the sun. Because they don't have a relationship with the start of the day or, or doing things well in the morning. They just don't have that relationship at all. So they can do things in the morning, but the best time is at night. Your best time is the morning, but you can do things at night. Right? So you, you can very quickly sort of establish just that little step one of who you are. And as of tomorrow, you keep that in mind because if everything that you do in the evening is critical to the rest of your life, critical, 
But what you do in the morning is is not so critical. Then it's worth just having a little review on that and seeing how you could maybe look into that as the months and seasons go by in front of you because every little change could help you. So Nick, expanding upon that, let's say um, they take that little test and uh, you know somebody finds out they're a PM chronotype, but they have a schedule that is very much more suited to the AM type. What are some practical changes that we might be able to make in our lives to line up with our chronotype a little bit better? Well, it's um, you know it's a great question, and the the answer to that is because you know we've always had night shift workers, we've always had people working at different parts of the twenty four hours. We've we've certainly moved into a twenty four hour world, so we've got even more people working. You know, whether it's in all the major online retailers who are sat there throughout the night and day processing all our goods. You know, so we've got a big twenty four seven, and the easiest way to do it is just to wander back to the point before we in, introduce light, uh, the electric light, and take an opportunity to investigate the fact that we've got four major sleep-wake cycles that have always been polyphasic, okay? That means multiple times in the 24 hours. It was only up until the light bulb that we went to one monophasic approach, which is the eight hours at night. So we've only had one approach to sleeping in one block, and that was because we invented light. We've always used a polyphasic approach. So when you look at somebody's scheduling and you take involved that they are this chronotype, but here's their, here's their routine, here's their, what they have to achieve. Then what you do use is if you use the polyphasic approach, sleeping in cycles rather than hours to put it in another way, what you can do is with Hani there, you know, he's, he's going to sleep later than an AM or would. 12, 1 o'clock at night. He's starting his day um, at a time that provides him with enough recovery time, but he's got to get on with his day because it's, you know, daytime. And so he has a balance of shorter cycles at night. So we'd, we'd shorten his sleep-wake cycle to get him up a bit earlier because we know he'll love that, but he just goes past that, yeah? So we'd get him up a little bit earlier, but we'd use the period between after the morning and midday period has gone, we would use the CRP, the nap for the old schoolers, um, the power nap for the people who don't understand it. Um, we would use the CRP early evening, 30 minutes, 20 minutes controlled, mind space, zone out, grab that moment in time as a little cycle before he starts the rest of his evening's activity and slightly shorter. So whether you're PM or AM, uh, using a polyphasic approach is probably the only way you can get through modern day life, never mind what's coming. And uh, when you look at single-handed round the world sailors, you know, going to sea for three months as a human being, and they can only sleep at certain points in time when so many factors are in place, uh, they, they have to adopt a, a, a multi-phasic approach. And that could be you know, 20 to 30 minutes tops alarmed in any six to seven or eight hour period. Right? And so we do have an ability to adjust and modify our approach going into an Olympics like we have over in Pyongyang now. You do have to be able to adjust. There's adrenaline, there's cortisol, there's, there's pressures of what we're doing and some of them are good, some of them are bad. We do have to take all these things into account when we're thinking about recovery. And the polyphasic approach just wins every time, wins every time. Awesome. Do you find that the discrepancies that Haney mentioned are common where somebody might be mentally sharp at a different time than when they're physically sharp and ready, ready to perform? Oh, guys, it's like trying to do a podcast with a sleep coach at this time of night in the UK. It's it's right in my mid mid evening slump and uh, I, I was unable to get my crp in just before i came on because you know my traveling got ex extended so if you were talking to me uh you know at i don't know half seven eight o'clock tomorrow morning you'd have a far better podcast guys <laughs> uh, <laughs> just for the uh for the americans out there half seven is seven thirty so uh <laughs> we and and no, to it's, true, Eric. it's uh you know i think you just you just 
once you start to understand it, you can't change everything that's going on in your life and everything. But if you can, you can. If I know I'm going into something like I I was coming into this, then you can actually do some little things that just will help with that situation uh, as much as you possibly can. If you're not aware of it, then you just end up in it, don't you, Eric? Mm-hmm. Uh, to just to define a term that Nick has used, CRP, a controlled recovery period, right? Yeah. So that's just a, a short nap where you don't actually go into a full cycle of sleep, and we'll we'll kind of elaborate on that a little bit later. So mo- moving on to the the next important subject here in the book, talking about sleep cycles as opposed to you know looking at sleep in in the context of cycles as opposed to in the context of just hours and you know they are in a way interchangeable when you understand what you're talking about because one cycle is just 1.5 hours in theory but this is kind of how we how we build the whole the whole plan and it, it all kind of stems around the idea of a constant wake time which is actually why i've uh, implemented 9 a.m. more recently, Nick. Uh, the reason that everyone laughed when when you asked what time I got up is because I, I went through a, a long period of being an absolute bum and uh, staying up late and getting up late every day. And uh, I'm doing my best to debumify myself and get up a little bit more early and consistently. I'm gradually shifting backwards uh, in terms of closer to the mo- the morning hours. That being said, the it all stems from the constant wake time, and we basically plan backwards from there. And for, so, can can you lay out the idea of sleep cycles and and in context what what those mean and how we can use that? Well, as long as everybody doesn't sort of you know giggle too much, laugh too much, let's say. Um, a long time ago, back in 1998, I was aware of obviously this this myth of eight hours and everything else, and people taking sleep for granted and you just wake up, wait till there's only so many hours left and then go to sleep again or see you in the morning type of concept that I thought there's absolutely no way I could talk to two young athletes in a male centric sport, uh, most of them wealthy, uh, with no fear, can absolutely do what they like. They're all in their 20s, if not younger. And I'm going to walk in there and start talking to them about sleep. It just wasn't going to work. Uh, I needed to redefine their thought process to it. And so, as you pointed out, um, I, I was fully aware that uh, in a clinical environment, we'd look at that 90 minute p- period to collect the right kind of data from the brainwave patterns to see where we are in sleep stages and little wake ups, awakenings, and things like that. Uh, and then you look at the next 90 minutes. So, as you pointed out, 1.5 hours. Uh, well, five 1.5 hours equals 7.5 hours. So 7.5 hours is pretty much whether you look at eight or this, it's about the number for a healthy adult. So instead of using eight hours or anything else, we started looking at five cycles. And as you pointed out before, one of the critical little points in any day is not necessarily the time we go to sleep, because that can be far more variable. It's more to do with starting the day and that sunup process. So the consistent, call it constant, makes us go, oh, I don't want a constant wake time. You know, I have days off and things. But a consistent wake time, consistent with their chronotype, consistent with the start of the day. If we use that as a point, then we've got something to build on. So in your particular case, Hanny, um, you pick 9 a.m., you, blo- you chop up your day into 90 minute cycles. Um, so when you go back from 9 a.m., you've got 7.30, 6 a.m., 4.30, 3 o'clock, 1.30, 12, and 10.30. And that goes all the way around back to nine. So what would happen with the principle of thinking in, in cycles rather than hours, not only can we identify our, our ideal sleep and wake times, that are consistent with the harmony and patterns of the circadian rhythms of the day, which is all about patterns and rhythms. The sun doesn't travel around our planet, you know, driven by anything other than a natural process. It's just happening. We can't affect it in the slightest. So it's all about patterns and rhythms. It means you can think about the first 90 minutes of the day, the second 90 minutes of the day, the midday 90 minutes, the early evening 90 minutes. And you can, so you would have sleep times, honey, of 10.30, 12 o'clock, 1.30, 3 o'clock, 
4.30 for just two cycles into 7.30 and into 9 a.m. So between 12 and 9 a.m. you've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You should actually be going to sleep at 1.30 and sleeping through to 9 a.m., which is five 90-minute cycles and 7.5 hours. So you telling me that you sleep around, you, you feel comfortable going to sleep between 12 and 1, is kind of because is if you've got a consistent wake time of nine, five 90 minutes a takes you back to about 1.30. I mean, so it's kind of, it doesn't, it was a thing that I thought about that if it was too far-fetched away from reality, it wouldn't work. But I hopefully you can see in that example, it actually related back to what they were doing, probably anyway, but without conscious thought. And it was so easy for them to get involved with that process and that's why I think when you look at it as we've developed that on, we can look at we sleep shorter periods at night, polyphasically. We use the midday window between one and three, basically, which is another cycle opportunity. The other one early evening between five and seven, which is the other one, but normally a shorter period there. Uh, so maybe 90 or 30 minutes midday is opportunist. But maybe 30 minutes is, is the best one, dependent, early evening. So we take the pressure off the evenings because of what we touched on before about schedules. We don't all do everything at the same time. But we give that opportunity to take the pressure off the nighttime sleep and add these cycles in. And to, to clarify how that really helps over the years with all the clients I've worked with, and, and you guys maybe as coaches as well, is when you look at a seven day period, because we can't control what's even in front of us, never mind seven days. We think we can, but we have no control over it. Is a seven day week would equal 35 cycles. That would equal around 7.5 hours a day. And so I can look at somebody's schedule and go there in a polyphasic way. I can see four cycles at night. I can see one cycle during the day. On the next day, I can see four cycles at night, but we need to put two in the following day because we're going down to three cycles on the third night because of an event and a game. They're not getting back till late. da di da di da you wander the way through, and I go, that week has a recovery uh, tick because there are 35 recovery cycles available to that athlete, so I will let that schedule go. So some athletes, that could be 28 cycles because they're only they're, they're actually work much better on six hours a day, right? Because we are a little bit different in these cases. So some of them work really well on a six, six hour, four cycle a day, which would equal 28 cycles in a week. But what we also can see is that the individual athlete doesn't need a coach, doesn't need an app, doesn't need anything to actually just work this out themselves and even work it out as it unfolds in front of them right i'm going to do that do that do that do that without even thinking about it and that's you know hopefully i've explained that well enough but that's the principle of trying to redefine recovery when everybody's just been taking it for granted and thinking eight hours and that's the way i did it and uh, it's been pretty successful Nick, have you ever found uh, that there are certain points where athletes might need a little bit more than what is their usual number of, of cycles per, per day or per week? Like if, if they're preparing for uh, a competition, for example, and their training is getting rather stressful? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great point. You know, this, this uh, you know, I, I work with a lot of professional boxers and they just want to, they'd rather be sleeping than actually boxing because they love their sleep. And there's a lots of people like that. I think what this does is, you know, Using this example, um, if my normal, consistent, everyday wait time is 9 a.m., if I go throughout my day and I'm trying to get 35 cycles or 28 in a week, you know, and sometimes I might not even sleep at all. Um, there's a lot of my clients who I'll be talking to um, because they can't sleep because they've got a snowboard you know, freestyle tube final tomorrow or a pipe tomorrow or they're skiing tomorrow. Because we try to, to, to make them understand that actually, under certain circumstances, sleeping actually can be more counterproductive than doing other recovery techniques because things are out of place. So there's no perfect night's sleep. So the reason I mention that is 
if I have gone through my week and it just hasn't panned out as I thought it was going to be, you know, that party went on longer, too long. I, I may have overdone that. I may have experienced a flight change or something. Is that if I consistently wake at 9 a.m., I might wake up in that first you know, hour of my day, I don't become overly active. I stay in a sort of recovery mode. I might hydrate a bit, and that, but I would go back to bed for the next cycle. I would put an alarm on. So I'm doing another 90 minute cycle. I'm not just falling asleep and drifting, right? I'm actually keeping within this scenario. So I want to add some more recovery in and I choose going into a sleep state to do this. So I'm going to add another cycle on. What I don't do is hit the snooze button and then just go back to sleep again. I want to keep that consistency of my normal wake time there. I know I've already predisposed myself the night before that I'm probably going to want to use tomorrow as recovery as well. But I do wake up. I do go and hydrate a little like that, maybe bowel and bladder. But then I go back to bed and do another 90 minute cycle or maybe two and put the alarm on for three hours. Do you see what I mean? Uh, or I may stay awake until I've got to midday and then do a 90 minute cycle midday when I know that's another natural sleep period for my brain. So I'm doing it at the right time, not just randomly. You said it. So that when you look at anybody's schedules, you can sleep uh, using this process. So you don't use it. It's not a lie in. You are increasing the level of recovery that you require because of what's happened, right? It, it's an important factor. But you're using this process properly. What I don't like to see is athletes, you know, going in for a recovery training day and it goes up till lunchtime and they have some, you know, fuel up at the club and everything else. And then they've got the afternoon off and they head back home and and get on the sofa and start gaming, pass out, and then we'll actually sleep for however long they will sleep for. And and so it could be two hours or three hours or four hours. It's absolutely out of control. So then you start getting completely out of sync and you start. So you use this process, not necessarily to catch up, but you because you can see it, you know, you can see it that that period is going to be tough. So if that's what happens, this is what we do, right? And we keep it like that. Put a 30 in, put two 90s in, put one 90 in. The key factor is keeping this pattern. So you're never, you're never trying to catch up from sleep deaths. It's gone. It's gone. Forget it. You know, it, it goes as soon as it happens. It's about trying to manage your recovery periods in a, in a very subconscious, natural way. And and that's why people sort of say, you you know. We have a term over in the UK called duvet days where, you know, we don't get out of bed and we watch films because we just we've just had enough of life and it's a long day and everything's been too much. And we just want to lie in the comfort of our private sanctuary bedrooms and just chill out. Well, of course, you can have duvet days. Of course you can. But as long as it's it's part of this process that's managed, not in a strict way, it's just managed. And when that starts to happen, you see people waking You'll always wake if your alarm's on most days of the week. You'll always wake then anyway. The brain is tuned to this. So you'll always wake or switch it off or snooze it. But if you just use that process, it's amazing because maybe the 90 minutes you put in an hour later because you go back and do another controlled recovery period, you'll wake up after that and go, fantastic, here we go, you know, rather than falling asleep randomly to catch up or going to bed earlier. I mean, that to me is it just shows that you've you've got you've got such a random structure to everything that you do that going to bed earlier means you've just become so tired that the only thing that's going on in your mind is to lie down flat and pass out. Right. And that's why anybody who likes lions and anybody who sleeps in on their most valuable days off and anybody who likes to go to bed early to catch up in my world is wasting valuable lifetime sleeping without benefits. So I think I think a nice parallel here is is looking at sleep like us powerlifters look at training volume. 
and that is that there's a certain amount we, we kind of want to accomplish in a week. And it's not necessarily that more is better or that less is better, but that better is better. And that, you know, consistency and utilizing it will will establish the improvement that we want. And so the example that Nick gave here with 35 cycles a week, that's an average of, what, five a night. And, you know, some people thrive on four. Some people need, what would six a night be, 42. And, uh, you know, every, everyone's obviously different, uh, I think. But, you know, based on the recommendation, most people fr- probably fall into the five a night, Nick. I, would you agree? Yeah. Certainly. So that that in mind, you know, the the constant wake time, establishing a time that suits all of your needs throughout the week that you can get up to work that, you know, if you if you are a person who thrives more in the evenings, allowing yourself more time to prepare for your day in the mornings. Uh, if since you know we do all have to get up and run on a or well, I won't say all, but most of us have to get up and run on a on an AM world's schedule, you can kind of design your day in a way that makes it manageable. Something that I thought was interesting that you you spoke about in the book was pre and post sleep routines. With uh, I think running on the the AM schedule, the pre sleep routine being more important for the PM chronotype, and the the post sleep routine being more important. Or did I reverse that? Pre sleep, whatever it is, but pre and post sleep <laughs> routines, <laughs> one being more important for each of the chronotypes, obviously, because people who are more awake at night have more trouble falling asleep, and people who are more awake in the morning. Either way, anyway, I'm confusing myself here, but yeah. well, you know, um, I I think the best rule of thumb, to be honest, guys, is is the post sleep period. You know, your first ninety minutes of the day, in principle, is is the most and becoming the most important part of anybody's day uh, within this context. What you try and do in the last hour or 90 minutes before your targeted sleep time has got so many distractions involved with it that uh, it's very difficult to actually give somebody a pre-sleep routine other than the very simple basics of moving from light to dark. Okay? That's what you want to be doing. Uh, you don't have to use the dramatic terms of shut your tech down and switch your life off and miss out on everything that's going on in the world. It's literally of moving light to dark. So reducing that 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 uh, exposure to light and moving towards dark. It still means you can be active. The other one is warm to cool. Um, you do need to have an environment around you or have things around you that allows you to move from a normal body temperature to a, a slightly cooler environment. Um, that is important. Uh, you also want to have, you know, completed your hydration for the day to allow the body to process all the food and everything you've put inside of yourself to create all of that fluid and to ha- be able to extract it naturally before you you try to sleep. So, you know, in simple terms, emptying the bladder is is important. The other one, obviously, from what you've been doing is to give every opportunity for your bowels to have opened, um, which comes back to the post one again. Um, because if you take, if you go warm to warm, like your bedroom's warm, your bed's warm, electric blankets, you've got PJs on, partners, big duvets, whatever it is. Uh, or e- even stress and anxiety creates body temperature, you know. Um, and if you're also exposing yourself to a lot of light all through the day and all your tech and everything else, and you keep exposed, that level of exposure goes on and on and on and on and on, it's very difficult to reduce that down quickly. So that will affect the way that you sleep. And if you're going to get a couple of hours and have to wake up to empty the bladder, which is so common for people, if you're going to be tossing and turning because you're still digesting food and, you know, uh, processing food stuff, that keeps the brain alert, that keeps you uh, alert. And that, then also that's a waste of time. And, and, you know, those sort of things are important. But I would put the emphasis back to a nice consistent wait time, like Hanny's nine o'clock, um, right? 
And the first 90 minutes of the day is important so that you get mental exercise, you get some physical exercise that can be just walking your dog or going on a bike or doing something. Ironing a shirt is a mental exercise, you know, preparing your lunch for the day is a mental exercise. Uh, getting nice levels of light in, if it, depending on the season. So if you haven't got light out, so then you need to have light inside, uh, which is good daylight light, not normal artificial light. Um, and I want to make sure that I've, I've fueled up. And I know this all makes sense to all everybody who's listening to this because you're all professional amateur powerlifters and you know all about this. But I meet so many people, guys, at all levels of sports who don't do these things. And they rush around in the morning. So making sure that that bowel has emptied naturally, so you're feeding off the good stuff, that will set you up. So everything you do now for the rest of the day, thinking about your chronotype, thinking about sleeping cycles, thinking about a balanced recovery and activity approach, like you pointed out a minute ago, thinking about, oh, grab that little CRP early evening because I've got a hectic evening tonight and that'll take the pressure off. You know, and all of those little things will mean that your focus on the pre-sleep will actually be far less intensive and come more naturally to literally the process of moving to your to your sleep time and and I do get a little bit hung up on people trying to look for quick solutions of you know if I listen to whales singing on this app if I listen to this if I've got this device by my bed or this wristband this or this and that or anything this supplement whatever it might be meditation all sorts of stuff uh, shut my tech down an hour before I go, but, or putting blue light glasses on so I'm still looking at screens and getting information overload. I'm just blocking myself from light. All of those things are just coming from a world that doesn't understand the true factors about us as humans. So I would always emphasize if Hani in this instance, who's been struggling to sort of start his day early enough, and you look at 9 a.m., if he couldn't have a good start to his day, I'm only using you in principle, honey, I'm not making you a focus, is if you couldn't have a really nice balanced 90 minute start to your day before you became who you are, then I would take you back a 90 minute cycle to 7.30. And I would move, because we know he's chronotypes AM or anyway, it was just kind of adjust him a little bit, is I would use 7.30 as his constant wait time. He'd have loads of time then to become honey, do all of those things I mentioned. So by nine o'clock, he's rocking. Right? He's rocking. He's ready. He's ready, you know? And he'll handle anything that comes around through the whole day and have a real nice plan. And that's why, you know, I, I feel much better about how you start your day in this context is because if you've been doing things all randomly and there hasn't been such approach, it really doesn't matter what you do in the last bit before you go and decided to go to sleep. Um, you're just going to probably spend hours in bed not getting the full benefit from it, you know. And I will shut up on this one, but I just want to remind everybody that, you know, six hours, seven hours, eight hours, it's a normal working day, is such a long time. It's a long, long, long time to have to be inactive mentally and physically with all those other factors, not drinking, not eating, not nothing. So... You do have to put it in context that the more that you've got this balanced, you want to fall into a sleep, go through two or three, four or five cycles without waking up, getting all the stages, wake up and go. You don't want to be lying there in bed, just tossing and turning and breaking sleep and everything else because you're not getting eight hours at all. You're getting a broken period of, you know, non-beneficial recovery. God, I can talk, guys. I will shut up now. <laughs> no, by all means, that's that's the whole point of a podcast is that people want to hear what uh, guests have to say. So, the you know you, you mentioned CRPs earlier, and you know I, I think the the example might come up in someone's mind where they are a full time student and they have a full time job, and they train four days a week, and they don't they just don't have time for naps. And so you you make a point in in one of the chapter summaries in your book regarding 
taking a break, you know, even even if it's a brief one, uh, about every 90 minutes during the day, away from technology, away from everything, and just, you know, and I think the example you gave in one of the chapters was something as simple as taking a leisurely stroll for a few minutes and coming back and returning to your work and how you might be able to refresh your mind and your ability to to approach these things. And I mean, this this might even apply in training, right? You know, it, we've had three, I've definitely done three or four and a half hour sessions before where if I had just gotten up and taken a walk and not thought about lifting for five minutes in the middle of a session, which five minutes is not a lot of wasted time. We all, you know, in those long sessions are taking 15 minute breaks because we're lazy assholes. But, um, but, uh, especially in those sessions, um, you know, the, I, I'm interested to know a little bit more on that. That was, that was one of the points in the book that, that kind of stuck out to me as something that's very, very much more so contrary to the norm, right? Because I've I've heard about ninety minute sleep cycles before, and and uh, I've certainly used that to my benefit before. The constant wake time was a concept that I hadn't really put together, but the the idea of taking a break every ninety minutes is is something that I think is is unique to to your publication here. Yeah, I think I think you you basically answered it. You know, it's um you know to hop back uh, at the point in time in in, in my life my story you know we had lots of recovery breaks guys lots of them because not because we planned for them or our parents or our schooling told us these were recovery breaks they just happened because there was nothing else to do right and so all the time you could experience little moments like you say it's, it was like walking to school or we'd get off the bus earlier because we wanted to go and play football in the park because there was nothing to do at home. Um, we were always, we'd always had lots of recovery breaks. If if we if we stopped doing something like if we're playing a playing a sport and we stopped to take on a drink or anything, then we would just talk to each other, right? Because there was nothing else to do. We've stopped to have a drink, a little bit of recovery break. We're doing a sport together, playing games together. Uh, but obviously, I won't point out what we do now. So all it is, is this whole process again, the first 90 minutes of that day, get yourself started, you know, and bring yourself into the world correctly. Because if you're one of those people who obviously uses a smart device as an alarm wake, uh, and then you're finding it very difficult to even get to your first, you know, to have your first we, your first pee to empty the bladder, which is what most of us would like to do on first wake, is to go and empty our bladder. And you're already streaming through the notifications on your device uh, in all sorts of areas, then that isn't the greatest start to the day. That's just information overload that you just don't need. Now, the only way I would have found out anything at that time of day is if I got on my bike, went to the local store to get a newspaper and read it, right? So the difference is, is the amount of information that we're constantly overloading ourselves. We don't have these little moments when we just stop and we don't know how powerful they are because of that. But as you're pointing out, they are so powerful. So every, I constantly think, because some people get wristbands that, that you know, vibrate every 90 minutes now. Uh, you can have something on your device. You can just naturally feel it. That's what I want to get to is you naturally feel that it's been an hour or so and then you do get a distraction you create them if you involve other people it makes it more difficult now as you said you know people in certain walks of life i can't find time to do this and i go well i'm sat by your desk right now i can see a bottle of water on your desk so the first thing you do is put back that back in the canteen or back in the kitchen or back in the fridge right so every now and again we'll go and get a drink instead of you just drinking it at your desk without even moving or any distraction you know sometimes there's loads of little areas and uh you know i used to just get on a train public transport and and like a lot of us i might just pass out you know boring being on a train and just have a little micro sleep or a nap you know where now because it's early evening, because I'm traveling home, <laughs> I get onto the train, I put all my personal belongings in safe and secure, put the headphones on and do a nap. 
do a controlled recovery period. Instead of just sitting on the train and doing other things and then maybe falling asleep, I actually go, there's my little moment. It's a recovery moment. It doesn't disturb my day. There's so many ways. And once you take the, I think most people will understand the graveyard slot in business. It's it's midday, it's the siesta in Spain, it's like you're in meetings or you're doing workouts and you're just drifting because of the power of that natural sleep, second sleep recovery period. So I can actually take a CRP in a room full of people, sat on a chair, just using things like mindfulness to simply just take myself out of the room I'm still awake, I'm still conscious, I can still hear everything that's going on, but I'm actually just taking 20 minutes, just like I would in a meeting or whatever, a zone out to just give myself a nice little moment. And once people start to, to put these little things in, like nobody's going to stop me going to the toilet. Nobody. Right? No matter where I am or what I'm doing, if I put my hand up in a lesson, you mentioned students, if I'm, if I'm doing a workout or anything else, I'm going to say, I I've got to go to the toilet. Nobody's going to say, you cannot do that. Wait for another hour, right? So if that's my way of getting my little distraction, just to sit in the toilet for five, ten minutes, because that's the wrong time of day to me for doing the exercising because I'm a bit AM chronotype, not a PM. -er. Do you see what I mean? When anybody says to me that they haven't got the time to create these little moments, then I can look at their schedule and go, you have got five times, five times as many opportunities to do this, never mind none of them. It's because you just haven't got this relationship with how important they are to you minutes every 90 minutes add up and i think that's where i have been most successful is is this seven and a half hours a day you know eight hours at night seven and a half hours a day 24 hours not night when you look at recovery in a 24 hour cycle then these little minutes all add up so i get my five cycles a minute every 90 minutes the first 90 minutes of my day it's all about bringing myself into the world a little 20 minutes on a train going home or sat on a bench or sat in a toilet or somewhere. And that's why it all adds up to a far more focused approach. And I probably get more recovery hours than most people think. But it's all broken up into this polyphasic 24 hours a day, which just helps enormously. So give me, a, I've, I've just done some, some schools and a big university in uh, Tennessee. We're about to start working with them in Tennessee with all the graduate surgeons and uh, they, they all love this approach because it makes sense to their world and uh, they will find those little moments when they know they can actually do it uh, in, in public. You don't have to be curled up in a corner in a bed to do this. It's, it's very, very simple. So as a, as a final subject here, something that I thought was, uh, and this is something I've adopted that I know a lot of people uh, don't or haven't is the idea of a, a room that's dedicated to sleeping and recovering in. and this is something you have you have a whole chapter on and you know minimizing distractions in the in the space in which you sleep and not utilizing your room for anything but that um, you know the the big one that gets a lot of people is that they have TVs in their bedrooms and that's that's something that I, I separated myself from a few years ago and it it's an immense difference when you don't have that glaring light in the background or something to distract you when you don't quite feel tired so you know if if you could give let's say the simplest layout of small changes someone could make to their to their sleeping space to to increase their ability to get more out of it what would you what would you say if you had to pick three do you mean that their own bedrooms in their homes yes yeah um I think the, the, if you're asking for three, I think that the first three that will make an enormous difference to how you approach this room is what we've been discussing today. And that would be tapping your browser about circadian rhythms, identify your chronotype and thinking cycles rather than hours. Those three things are going to have an enormous effect on this environment. But if you're looking, because everything else you do will be diluted if you don't, if you know what I mean. Okay. Let, me, let me interrupt you for one sec, Nick. Uh, I, I'm referring to three things specifically, let's say physical changes they can make in, in their bedroom. 
like uh, you, you identify closing out all light or choosing particular types of bedding and things like that. I apologize. My question was unclear. No, no, no. I've, I've just answered it in a, in a, in a, an obtuse way. What I'm saying to everybody uh, to answer your question is uh, I will give you three things from your environment, but you must understand that all the other things that we've spoken about are, are critical to this environment. And, and, and if you just change the things in your environment, they'll have little effect unless you do the circadian rhythm cycles and chrono type. So that's fine. Right. So in your room, we talked about uh, warm to cool. Um, you need to try and have things within that room that you can control temperature, whether you can open windows, whether you've got fans, um, but just try to always think that whatever adjustment you can make to keep that room cooler, not cold, but cooler than the rest of the house and cooler than your body temperature is key. The, um, you mentioned the environment about light. You want to be able to, to move from light to dark. So, so blackout blinds uh, can be key to this process. Um, but anything else like standby lights from TVs, uh, if you can't take the TV out, then just put a little black tape over the standby light so you can still switch it on and off, but you take the light out. So you're trying to remove uh, technology from your bedroom as much as you possibly can. Uh, ideally, take it all out um, and try to create darkness with uh, blackout blinds or blackout curtains. Um, but the other little thing that's quite important with that process is a little tool called a dawn wake simulator, which is a little lamp that would come on, say, for you at 8.30. It would fill the room with daylight, and so you'd wake naturally at 9 o'clock. When you open the curtains, it doesn't matter whether it's winter or summer. Uh, that's a way of controlling this process of light to dark and warm to cool. And the other little one is don't get too hung up on the fact that these very um market led mattresses and products associated around there make a lot of really big claims about what they can do to improve the levels of your quality of sleep or not and uh, the simple rule of thumb for us all as human beings is a natural fetal position on the opposite side to your dominant side and whatever surface that you're choosing to lie down on should not actually require you to have to put a pillow under your head. It should release to your body shape in a per perfect postural way, whatever it's made of, wherever it is. Uh, so be careful of how much you put emphasis on these very elaborate mattress products uh, and just remind yourself that as humans, we're quite happy to curl up under a tree outside and we haven't moved on that much from that point. Fair, I like that. Uh, so with that being said, I think we're probably going to bring this episode to a conclusion. Um, you know, there's obviously a, a dense amount, amount of information here. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, we've, we've pretty much scratched the surface at, at best. And I think there's, there's simply a wealth of so much more, an explanation of what we could go into. So Nick, before, before I kind of go through my ending credits here, as it were, I, I do want to say thanks on behalf of the three of us and, and everyone listening that it was definitely a pleasure to have you on. I know you're a busy guy. No, it was a pleasure as well, and uh, sometimes there's a danger of having, having somebody who's so passionate about their subject, but um, there you go. We could talk for, for a long, long time about all the individual subjects, but it was an absolute pleasure, and thanks for asking me. And for, for anyone wondering, uh, Nick's book is called Sleep, The Myth of Eight Hours, The Power of Naps, and the New Plan to Recharge Your Body and Mind. It's available on Amazon. It's only about 10 bucks. It's it's a, a very affordable uh, little book here, and it's certainly some, it's something, you know, Eric has a copy, Joe has a copy, I have a copy, and uh, I would highly recommend uh, picking it up. You know, there's a lot of good information in there, and it can be a little handbook for your recovery and improving yourself. Uh, before we wrap up, one more shout out to the sponsor of the Strength Athlete Podcast. That's SBD USA. Uh, you can go to their website, sbd-usa.com, and use our coupon code SBDTSA in all capitals for free shipping on an order of any size. Um, Nick, do you have do you use social media at all for any of your business? Yeah, we have a I have a little team around me because we're always in contact with everybody. But uh, at Sports Sleep Coach, Twitter is probably the best place to go. We're Instagram, Pinterest, LinkedIn. Uh, we have a sportsleepcoach.com where there's a lot of blogs, lots of services, lots of information that's always going on in and around that area. So, you know, that's the at 
at Sports Sleep Coach on Twitter or sportsleepcoach.com. Um, and we, we are an international business, so you know, whoever's listening, don't be don't hesitate to get in touch if you want. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I am at Hanny underscore TSA on Instagram where you can find me primarily. I've got Joe underscore TSA and Eric underscore TSA as well. Uh, Thank you on behalf of all of us for listening. And that's a wrap.